Welcome to Media Gita. And welcome to a new artist series. I've just concluded my discussion of Kurt Cobain, someone who I view as one of the greatest artists, music or otherwise, of the 20th century. Now we're going to move on to someone who also is of that ilk, and perhaps, in my opinion, even more talented than Kurt Cobain. Elliot Smith. Who is Elliot Smith, and why do I want to do a series on him? He's a singer-songwriter. He has been dead since 2003, when he committed suicide. Now, lest you think I have a certain fascination and exploitation <clears throat> with people and artists who have committed suicide exclusively, let's just remember that there's a pretty close tie between genius and mental illness. And so if I'm going to be looking at people who are so-called geniuses, though I don't think Kurt Cobain nor Elliot Smith is a genius, they were just very good at what they did, if someone's going to be that talented <clears throat> and put in so much emotion, time, and themselves into their music, such as Elliot Smith did, then there's also a fragile side to that. There is, you know, that, that emotion doesn't just go away after you've written the song. Why am I stuttering? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that emotion just doesn't go away, though. So you use the songwriting, as Smith did, as a way to process things. But it doesn't always solve the problem. So it's fair to say that Elliot Smith had depressive tendencies. That's part of what made his art so great. And that these types of artists often are their own worst enemy. So, all that to say, I'm not necessarily <clears throat> obsessed with people or men or artists whom have committed suicide. It just so happens that some of the best ones either drugged themselves out, you know, strung themselves out, or drank themselves to death, or by this point, the trope of the tortured artist, self-destructive in path, is a cliché. It's a hole behind the music on VH1. But there is a reason for the cliché. And those kind of things we're going to explore here in our discussion of Torment Saint, The Life of Elliot Smith, by William Todd Schultz. Now, as with the Heavier Than Heaven audiobook, I didn't cover that whole thing. I jumped in somewhere around July 1993, way after they were famous, um, because it really was the decline of Cobain's life. And I'm going to do something similar here. Elliot Smith was in a band called Heat Miser, and basically what happened was he began to grow beyond Heat Miser. They were a rock band, and he wanted to do something a little bit different, something a little bit more serious, um, something to express his emotion and point of view and where he was coming from. And he felt he couldn't do that in Heat Miser, so he kind of struck out on his own with an acoustic guitar at a time in the mid to late 90s when that kind of thing was like the least cool thing you could do. It was all about bands, especially in the Portland, Oregon area that Heat Miser and Elliot Smith were performing a lot. So I'm going to start my commentary, not in this video. This is going to serve kind of as an introduction, not the intro in the book, but my own. I'll tell you more about how I came to be involved with, not involved, uh, we didn't have a romantic relationship, but how I came to love the music of Elliot Smith. Now, I don't think I had an epiphany moment, and I can't remember who introduced me to the music of Elliot Smith. Because it was a while ago. It was around, actually, it wasn't too long ago. I, I became interested in Smith around 2004, 05. <clears throat> Again, after he was dead, you know, something about great artists, it takes a couple years for their work to reverberate in the culture. You know, great art is not dated. So, you know, all these songs by Rihanna or whatever about Instagram. I mean, talk about music that's going to sound stupid in five years. But if you're writing about the human condition... Uh, if you're using lyrics that are not only double entendre, 
I refuse to certain words. You know, French is really funny because I guess you would pronounce it entendre, but I like to just pronounce as few letters in a French word as possible because that is how they speak. So Elliot Smith wrote in a lot of double en. And even certain songs like Between the Bars, um, the author here, William Todd Schultz, will kind of write about triple en. All right, Between the Bars. And we'll get there. So the music of Elliot Smith was not only incredibly lyrically complex, while also retaining that kind of ethereal, <clears throat> mythical, and hard-to-define quality um, that was very much similar to Kurt Cobain's lyrics. Sorry, when there's these long pauses, I'm trying to think of words. Not necessarily big synonyms, not huge words to show how many synonyms I know and that I'm not losing my perspicacity, although that certainly is a temptation. It's like, shut the fuck up, me Gita. Stop trying to use big words. No, sometimes I'm just trying to think of a word, the word. But it was this lyrical quality that Elliot Smith had <clears throat> of lyrics that were at once personal but universal, vague yet specific, and poetic. Now, a great companion piece. So part of what I would like you, the listener, to do, because you guys have encouraged me to continue. I mean, frankly, I'm going to be moving <clears throat> next Friday. Today is Saturday, so I'll be doing videos up till then. Then there will be a long gap. Maybe. I don't know. But at least this series gives me something to look forward to and something for you to look forward to. Now, dare I lose my train of thought, let me just mention this. Having something to look forward to is not like a, a trait of depression. We all need things to look forward to. You know, go ahead and leave that half carton of ice cream in your freezer. Don't eat the whole thing because you're going to feel like shit. Plus, you won't have any left. You won't have something to look forward to. So, doing this series on Torment Saint, the book, of which I will read myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and, and that's one of the bonuses you get with my readings, ladies and gentlemen, is a whole lot of throat clearing and, like, talking to my dog. So, you know, much better than audible.com. Um, okay, Medigito, you see what you did? You lost your damn train of thought like you knew you would. But the lyrical vagueness, the you know, the writing. Now listen, when you think about the artists, the great artists of the 20th century, and Elliot Smith really straddled that, he literally was on that line of the 20th and 21st centuries. He killed himself in 03, but he was creating some of his best work around 2001, 2002. Okay, which would later be posthumously released. Um, what is the album? It's not New Moon. Anyway, you suck today, Medigito. Oh, I'll have all the facts for you. And it'll all be in the book. <clears throat> so, you know, when I talk about some of the greatest artists of the 20th century, you know, we don't need to be entirely literal and go, oh, well, Elliot Smith, you know, he existed in the 21st century for three years. Okay, okay, let's just... And that's part of the reason for this introduction right here is to get some things out of the way Set the stage for my love for Elliot Smith. Again, it sounds super gay. Uh, yeah, whatever. My love for Elliot Smith. There you go. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. And if you don't know much about him, I'm really looking forward to hopefully educating you. But that's the other part of my plea here. All right, so you have homework, dear listener. Because chances are you don't know all that much about Elliot Smith. Or you're a super mega fan. I don't know if there's going to be much of a middle ground. You might have heard his song Miss Misery, which, um, did it win? No, no, no. But he played at the Academy Awards in 1998. We'll go on to cover that, of course. And, um, yeah, his song Miss Misery was big, but Ellie Smith didn't ever really have any big singles. But you have homework, LNG. Okay. So, I'm not going to say you need to read this book, Torment Saint. That is what this series is for. But, there's a pretty good documentary about him. What was it called? Heaven loves, heaven adores you. Okay. When I say pretty good, and I'm sure I'll be talking about heaven adores you in concurrence with this series, as to date, it's the definitive Smith documentary, though I don't think by any means uh, is it the best. 
I mean, it's definitive because it's one of the only ones. Unfortunately, here are my problems with it. The director just uses a whole lot of exterior shots of, like, Portland buildings. Okay? Um, there's not enough Elliot Smith music in the film. <clears throat> I just found it dull. Considering Smith had a very interesting life, I don't think it delved deep enough into his self-destructiveness, especially during the latter two years of his life. But listen, that's what I'm here for. All right? I love Elliot Smith music. Elliot's... Elliot... <laughs> uh, are you sure you do? I love Elliot Smith's music. All right? And so what I'm hoping to do <clears throat> is to convert you as well. So your homework is to first check out Heaven Adores You. Maybe not first. Do all this at the same time. Heaven Adores You. Now, where can you watch it? I don't know. I don't know. Unfortunately, they didn't really make it that widely available. You may have to buy it or rent it. But it's a good summary of his life. <clears throat> secondly, you need to listen to the guy's music. You know, should, not secondly. This should be a primary concern for you. Now, where did I start? I believe I started with his album, Figure Eight. Again, I don't recall some kind of celestial moment in which a buddy of mine was like, hey, you got to check out this music. And I did, and I was like, the heavens have opened, and now I understand. But one interesting point that they go into in Heaven Adores You, for example, is how in the Portland scene, when Elliot decided to go solo and was performing this music that was really resonating with people in Portland, um, people were just like, this is like the best thing I've ever heard. You know, I mean, there are pal parallels. I'm sorry that I can't speak today. Again, I'm I'm just too excited, you guys. Too excited to start a new series and talk to you about Elliot Smith. That's my excuse. Uh, parallels between what? Between Smith's music and that of Bob Dylan. Now, having read a Dylan biography off and on for the last year or so, and now finding myself in the 80s where he's... Christian, you know, born again and preaching, literally like preaching to his audience that doesn't want to hear it. I'm starting to agree with Pete Seeger, who is like, Dylan was a genius for five years in the early 60s. That's it. I'm kind of starting to agree. Okay. You can say that Blood on the Tracks 1975 was seminal. All right. So what? He does some great work until Highway 61 Revisited then drops off for 10 years, does one great album, and never does anything great again. That's kind of how I feel about Bob Dylan. You know, it's just some of the things that he wrote, like ro <laughs> like Like a Rolling Stone, with its endless verses, and just this kind of quality that was almost biblical, that was allegorical, that was proverbial in its meaning, in its story of a woman down on her luck after being privileged for most of her life. You know, Dylan himself saying that <clears throat> this song just flew out of him. The, the greatest artists, the ones who are humble enough, at least, <clears throat> will tell you, like, I don't write songs, I just listen. So that's what Elliot Smith did, is he really listened to himself. Because the goal for these artists, for all artists, at least what it should be, whether it's a melody that you have rolling around your head just endlessly, or a picture in your mind, a scene, a visual of a beach and a woman standing on it, and a dog that's just running off the, off the screen, that's running out of frame. I know, I get it. I sound stupid. I don't care. Or if it's, you know, three great rhyming lines on a page. The goal of all these artists is to get the vision in the head exact. Get it exact in your medium. Okay? And so Elliot Smith did a lot of listening to himself. Because that is what you do when you write a song. You sit down and you shut up and you listen to yourself. And you try things out and you go over it again and again. 
And eventually you have something that is a fact, that is part of public record. Because you did yourself and your audience the gift, you gave yourself and your audience the gift of sitting down and letting it flow, letting it come in. You gave yourselves the gift of silence. Art is created when you are alone and when you're silent. So what you can do for yourself, dear listener, is what I did, which is check out Figure 8, released in 2000, I believe. That entire album is an experience. Now, when we talk about artists, the great artists of the 20th century, because that's the reason I mentioned Dylan, right? Your average person is going to say Bob Dylan and the Beatles, and maybe, you know, whoever their favorites are, David Bowie. Um, But, you know, they'll make arguments for lesser artists like the Rolling Stones or whatever. Jimi Hendrix, they'll say. When we talk, when we talk about a whole artist, so Jimi Hendrix, for example, certainly a genius level guitarist, but his, his lyrics were okay. You know, he was on that trip. It was more interesting than most, but they were not genius lyrics. Okay. Again, I don't like this entire concept of a genius because you're already, when you're a genius, you can only go downhill. You can only stop being a genius. Nobody, I don't know if anyone is like an artistic genius because art, by its very definition, is not factual. You can certainly be a mathematical or scientific so called genius um, by creating or defining new theories, breaking new ground. Okay. But you're not going to get the MacArthur Genius Grant for solving equations that everyone else has. So art is not factual. So I don't know how you can be a genius in art. So I think that term is overused, especially for certain people who decidedly are not. Okay, Bob Dylan <clears throat> was not a genius. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's just it's it's a tricky term. So when we're talking about Jimi Hendrix. He was great, but he was no Elliot Smith. Now, before you think I exaggerate, check out Figure Eight. Because that entire thing is a sonic experience on the level. Now, I've heard a lot about Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, which is essentially Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson's Pet Sounds. That man is often heralded as being a genius. Okay. Um, Fine. To be honest with you, I've never really listened to Pet Sounds in its entirety. I think God only knows, and some of these singles, you know, Wouldn't It Be Nice or whatever, are on there. I don't know. It just, you know, it goes to show how clueless I am about artists that I'm not particularly interested in. But the ones that I am, I tend to really be interested in them. Elliot Smith being one of them. So, figure eight, back to front, is fucking great. Well, what is a great album, Media G Tao? You know, in 2018, a lot of the music is shit. Okay. But even the stuff that is in your genre, say you like rock music. You know, and I couldn't, man, either, you know, it's probably both, but either I'm old or all the music sucks. I'm sure it's both. No, no, no. All the music sucks is something an old man says. I'm just saying, when you talk about great current rock bands, who are you going to say, man? Foo Fighters? They're okay. They're okay. First two albums were terrific, but we don't, I don't know, man. We don't need big guitar rock. We don't need fucking rock and roll that does the same shit that all the other rock does. But the thing is, pop feels good. I'm trying to remember who said, no, Billy Corgan said, pop is porn. Okay? And you know exactly what I'm talking about, where it's a melody that you've heard a bunch, but it feels good. Elliot Smith did that sometimes, but he certainly wasn't doing it intentionally. He was working on a whole other level. Now, the greatest artists of the 20th century, people are going to tell you, well, definitely the Beatles, man. And Bob Dylan, you know, for sure. Jimi Hendrix, were, you know, he's great. Uh, I love the talking heads. Okay, fine. The only, you know, the only people who come close are Bob Dylan. And when we talk about, you know, this word genius needs to go. Okay. It just needs to go. And it will go for the series I'm about to do in regards to Elliot Smith. So when we talk about immense talent, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, so the Beatles... Controversial statement coming up. 
the Beatles are probably the most overrated band of all time. Now, I like them. And everyone likes them. But I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah, Dylan. Dylan himself did not like uh, Sgt. Pepper. Okay, He thought it was just elementary kind of nursery rhymey stuff. So the Beatles really fit into their time and place. I've never been a huge super fan. Even though I've read biographies on them, I don't necessarily need to be super interested in an artist to check them out. I mean, I've listened to, a couple months ago, I listened to an audio book, uh, Joe Perry's Rocks. I don't like Aerosmith. I kind of do, maybe, you know. I find the rock stuff to be really interesting to check out. But ultimately, it just becomes kind of all the same, right? Cocaine in the 80s. <clears throat> Egomaniacal lead singer. Friction. That's why, you know, we started off this introduction talking about behind the music in cliches. Um, does Elliot Smith become a cliche of himself? I guess, I guess. I think it was a lot more sad than that. So Figure Eight and also XO. XO is another terrific album. Um, and then we would have New Moon. And then From a Basement on the Hill was the album I was mentioning that was released posthumously. Um, for you dummies, that means after he was dead. So he didn't get to complete From a Basement on the Hill. He was in the midst of working on it when he killed himself. So I will certainly get to this in several videos, but that album was Elliot Smith really pro pushing the creative edge. Yes, he was incredibly mentally unstable and strung out on all sorts of drugs, but when you listen to a song like King's Crossing, that reminds me, you have homework, listener. And you can do it pretty darn easily. Go to Spotify. Figure eight. Listen to that entire album. XO. Not as good as figure eight. Figure eight, in my mind, is still his absolute best work. It is. And Elliot Smith was very influenced by the Beatles. And you can hear it very much in songs like Baby Britain, which at the beginning almost sounds like, You got to admit it's getting bad, so it's getting bad, so all the time, right? So, heavily influenced by the Beatles, but what he did was better than the Beatles. His lyrics were better than the Beatles. In terms of art, in terms of many meanings, okay, he was like Cobain and Dylan in his ability to write lyrics that would resonate with the listener who cared to listen. And who really felt the same way. So, when I first heard of Elliot Smith, I had returned from a trip out of the country in 2003. And I saw my buddy, and my buddy said, yeah, I said, what's been going on? What's new? What did I miss? He said, well, this, you know, do you know who Elliot Smith is? I said, no. And he said, yeah, he killed himself. So, that was a real bummer. He, I really liked his music. And I said, oh, that sucks. And it wouldn't be until about two years later that I would actually listen to Smith's music. So getting back to one of the original points in this introduction, art takes time. And if it's written timelessly, then eventually it will find an audience. This video that I'm doing right now may only have five views when you listen to it, but just think in a year it may have 15 views. So, I am very excited to begin this series. Um, I think I'll have time to do a video tomorrow, not today. But that's fine, listener, because you have homework. Now, it's possible that I'm just uh, talking to one or two of you. I mean, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed to know that you guys are listening and you enjoy what I do. Those of you who actually take the time to say that, I appreciate it because I'll admit to you as, you know, as well, when I watch a video I like, maybe I'll like it. I don't always leave a comment and tell the creator that I like it, you know? So when you do, it means a lot, not just to me, but to any creator. Now, some of these guys, <clears throat> they're so big that they take you for granted, you know? Uh, but that's the nice thing about being punk and small and unknown is that I don't. I don't, but I can't see... You know, if I'm still doing this in a year somehow, I can't see myself being like, oh, I've got a lot of listeners. I don't care when I get it. I, I'll read all your comments still, man. 
The problem is why I considered hanging it up and fucking quitting this channel is because people are so sensitive and politically correct that they they get their little feelings hurt and they want to call me a misogynist and stuff. And that's fine. Um, I don't necessarily make videos about women. Women certainly factored into the life of Elliot Smith. And we'll see how with Joanna Bohm. I think that was her last name. And, gosh, Jennifer Chiba. And a couple other of his girlfriends, how they factored into his life. Elliot Smith wrote a lot of songs about women. So if we're talking about Anthony Bourdain or David Foster Wallace or Kurt Cobain or Elliot Smith, in all four of these cases, these men were uh, highly interested in women, highly sensitive, and really had some bad experiences. Whether it was their fault, the artist, or the women they got involved with, I don't know. We'll find out. But they certainly let their experiences with women <clears throat> depress them. So, <clears throat> we will begin, Elliot Smith, Torment Saint, um, by William Todd Schultz, tomorrow. For now, this has been Media Gito. You have homework. It's going to make the difference between this series <clears throat> and the one about Cobain or the Deliverance audiobook or anything else that resembles a series on this channel, such as The Uncultured Show. The difference is, this is now interactive. You're going to get a lot more out of it. If you, even if you don't like Smith, you, you know, there's a problem. There is a misconception about the music of Elliot Smith that he only sang depressing stuff. Listen to figure eight, man. I guess there's some of those, you know, everything reminds me of her. These are still beautiful melodies. And so I think I find it really reductive and almost offensive. Again, when I say offensive, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about... Uh, I don't like the word retard. Okay. I'm talking about offensive on a deep kind of moral level where you don't get what the fuck is going on. So I find it offensive when people are like, that's sad music. He just writes sad music. Uh, okay. I mean, you know, what kind of music do you listen to, man? You just listen to fucking Demi Lovato's songs about heroin overdoses? I don't know. I don't know. So... There is a misconception about Elliot Smith that he is a he is a whiner. I don't find that to be true. Um, again, I think in several ways he's more talented than both Kurt Cobain and Bob Dylan. Don't forget your homework, figure eight and XO, as well as watching Heaven Adores You. See, I'm confused already because I just talked about Heavier Than Heaven. Now I have Heaven Adores You. But I'll keep it straight, ladies and gentlemen. For now, if you like this introduction to my new series, like the video. And subscribe. Tell your friends. This has been Media Gito. Have a nice day.